You're probably familiar with the story of Pinocchio, particularly the Disney version that came out in 1940, where Pinocchio is a wooden mannequin puppet made by Geppetto, who, as he's going to bed, wishes Pinocchio could be a real boy and wishes, looks up in the sky and wishes upon a star that Pinocchio could be made into a real boy, and he does get made into a real boy. But there's a catch. Anytime he tells a lie, his nose is going to grow. And then he goes off on an adventure, and Jiminy Cricket comes along to be his conscience, help him learn right from wrong. What is it that taught you right from wrong? Was it maybe your parents who just said, this is right, this is wrong. Why? Well, because I'm dad and I said so, or I'm mom and I said so. Or was it maybe uh, a, a religious upbringing? Uh, are you a Christian? Then the Bible should dictate your worldview. A Muslim's going to go to the Quran. Now, as a Christian, I believe the Bible is what is going to make my worldview, and it's going to tell me right from wrong. And that is going to influence my conscience, because if the conscience is not properly taught, if it is not properly conditioned, it's not going to be a safe guide. And that's what we're going to look at today. So, get your Bibles. Oh, and don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel. Click on the subscribe bar when the notification bell pops up. Click on it. You'll be notified anytime I add content to the channel. Comment on these videos, like these videos, share these videos, and get your Bibles now if you're all set. Have a seat. Open up to uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 1. We'll start there. We'll also be looking at 1 Timothy and at 1 Corinthians chapter 10. All set? All right, and remember, if you're not careful, you might just learn something before we're done. So let's get started. And don't worry, this isn't going to bother your conscience any. Little thing here. Okay, I think we got it. It sounds like the sound is even working. Okay, and everyone that is uh, here, we started a series last week. Uh, oh, I forgot to tell you uh, something I forgot to uh, have put in the announcements. We actually have a door prize today. No, I mean really, a door prize, a door. Uh, we put a new uh, door on the front of the parsonage, and the uh, old one, it's a white one, uh, is in the garage. It's still in really good shape. If you know anyone who needs a door, we got a door prize for them, okay? All you got to do is come get it. So, yeah, you didn't know you were going to have door prizes at church, did you? Yeah, I know, it's a lame joke, but hey. It's the best I can do. If you want to hear the lamer ones, ask my daughter. She'll tell you some even... Anyway. Anyway, so we started last week looking at this idea of all roads leading to heaven. Another popular fiction that I call it. And we looked last week at, I'm sincere, so I must be right. Everything must be good between me and God because of my sincerity. And we looked at the, oh, sincere... Uh, in Acts chapter 18, we looked at um, Apollos and Aquila and Priscilla, and how, yeah, he was sincere, but he was still wrong on some things. And then we went into chapter 19 and looked at the disciples of John the Baptist that uh, Paul found, and that's all they knew was John's baptism. So uh, here again, sincere, but they were uh, needed some fine-tuning. So he taught them and then uh, baptized them again, uh, and that's one uh, record we have in the scriptures of uh, someone being baptized again. That was last week. Next week, we're going to look at this idea. Is one church as good as another? That's going to be next week. And that one sometimes really gets people to thinking. So I wanted to give you a little, just a preview announcement about that's what we're going to do next week. This week, we're looking at our conscience. Is our conscience a safe guide? How many have ever been asked or told you know, what does your conscience tell you about this? Or, hey, just follow your conscience. Or I saw a, uh, years ago a, a preacher on TV say, I'll worship God according to the dictates of my conscience. Is that going to be right? Is that the way we should make decisions just based on our conscience? Now, uh, I'm going to give you an extreme example here of someone whose conscience really didn't bother them. 
and how we've got to really be careful with this idea of just following our conscience. Someone that uh, very notorious you've looked at from history, Adolf Eichmann. He is considered by many historians to be the architect of what was called the final solution to the Jewish question, that is, the Holocaust. In a nutshell, he was the director of what was called Reich Security Department 4B4. He was basically the transportation director. He made sure the trains ran on time to Auschwitz and Buchenwald and Dachau and uh, Treblinka and those places. And when the war was winding down and Germany was retreating on all fronts, sending uh, not just Jews, but uh, Jehovah's Witnesses were a favorite uh, uh, target, as were homosexuals and uh, gypsies and political prisoners. Uh, sending them to Auschwitz took priority over getting supplies to the front. That's how fanatical uh, he and then the rest of the Nazis were. That's him on trial in Israel. He was captured by Mossad, the Israeli Secret Service, in uh, 1960 and was eventually hanged for all of his assorted crimes. But in the end, he said, to sum it up, I must say I regret nothing. His conscience wasn't really bothering him with what he did. And this quote is attributed to him, but I really can't honestly find a source where he actually said it, that I will leap into my grave laughing because of the feeling that I have five million human beings on my conscience is for me a source of extraordinary satisfaction. A couple of reasons. I'm not sure that he said it. Number one, the five million figure is off. But if he didn't say it, it's believable that he could have and it, or he could have expressed this sentiment. So that can show you what our conscience can be seared to where it's not going to bother us to do some really horrendous things. Charles Manson never really understood why he was in prison. Because he didn't do anything. It was his underlings, his minions that did it. So is the conscience going to be a safe guide for us? And my answer to that is not necessarily is the conscience going to be a safe guide. It's got to be some, have something guided. When we, when we talk about the conscience... We're looking at a, 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 the fact that we all have a standard by which we think we should be governed. How do I make decisions, particularly dealing with moral issues, right and wrong? The, the problem is a standard is not always going to be correct. And especially when you look at man-made standards that are not uh, any, in any way linked to Scripture. Because that is going to be the, the one thing that, that we uh, are going to be uh, basing on, as a Christian, my worldview is going to be biblically based. And if it's not biblically based, then at some point it is going to become subjective. The conscience is the part of our mind that approves or disapproves of our actions. And so what am I going to base my decision on, right or wrong? Is it going to be the Bible? Maybe it's going to be what my parents told me. Okay, so what did they base their views of right and wrong on? Or maybe it's going to be what the party told me in places like Nazi Germany or communist Russia. And then that is going to probably go back to some strong man, some leader. Trotsky is the one that came up with the phrase politically correct. We must be politically correct in the thoughts of Lenin. So Lenin was going to be the basis of what they uh, viewed as right or wrong. And then it would get into subjective. You don't want to criticize the leader because you could end up uh, in trouble. That could be considered wrong. So the conscience is not the standard itself, but it tells me if my actions have violated the standard. If my actions have violated what I uh, should be holding to as right or wrong, whether that be, again, the Bible or whether it be what my parents taught me, whether it be what uh, my teacher at school taught me, uh, that is going to be the conscience, uh, or is going to be the guide, then my conscience is going to uh, tell me whether I'm violating it. Here's, here's one example that we have in John chapter 8, where uh, Jesus, remember, the woman caught in adultery. And as Jesus stooped down to write in the dirt, it says, that, you know, that's when he said, all right, whichever one of you is without sin, you throw the first stone. And then being convicted by their own conscience, starting with the oldest to the youngest, they all left. Kind of interesting that the oldest went first. Have you ever noticed that? I wonder why. Maybe it was their guilt from years of uh, uh, living and understanding. Because, you know, we don't know what Jesus was writing. I tend to lean towards him writing out their names and their sins. What I mean, wouldn't that get your attention? Here's this guy. What's he writing there? Oh, that's my name. Oh, wait a minute. He 
He put that, I did that when I was t- a teenager. Hmm, yeah, I think I hear my wife calling me. I won't like, calling me. And away they went. So the conscience is, is not the standard. It tells me if what I did was right or wrong. And so what's, that, so what's our purpose? Why did God give us this? Now, what we have to understand, uh, years ago I had, I had a friend in college who believed that the, your conscience was basically the Holy Spirit that God put in you. No, it's a long story, another discussion for another time, but no, that's not the Holy Spirit, okay? Uh, your conscience and the Holy Spirit are not the same thing. But keep in mind, our conscience, while not perfect, is what will help us live a life of godly conduct. Remember, the conscience can be seared. It can be, and I'm, we're going to look at that here in a minute, but it can be uh, nullified just like with the Nazis. And again, that's an extreme case, but it didn't bother those men and those women to do the things they did during the war. And so Paul seems here to be identifying the conscience as a human ability to judge if an action is correct. What we read just a minute ago in, in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 1. That uh, the testimony of our conscience, uh, that in holiness and godly sincerity, not in fleshly wisdom, but in the grace of God, we have conducted ourselves uh, in the world and especially towards you. So, you know, he's saying we, we uh, uh, followed our uh, conscience here, and Paul affirms that he behaved in good faith and godliness in his dealings with the Corinthians. So his, his, his conscience wasn't bothering him in any way that he dealt with them, and Corinth was one of the tough cases that he had to deal with. Ephesus was probably second, but he had to deal with some pretty tough cases here in Corinth and some pretty serious issues uh, in Corinth. And he wants them to know, hey, we did everything uh, in good faith in dealing with you. He made it clear, this conscience, uh, when you go on and read uh, the text, this conscience, he'll be judged by God. And uh, you know, he'll be the, God is the one that he will ultimately give account to. And then look at Timothy. Timothy and Titus, both in Ephesus and in Crete, uh, dealing with a lot of immorality. Crete was probably you know, another tough one up there with Ephesus and Corinth. But Timothy is to seek God's affirmation. Remember, God's affirmation and assurance when he's dealing with these men who are distorting God's truth. And remember, too, that Timothy and Titus were both young men. And, you know, the older we get, we tend to not really want to listen to the young, to the young folks a lot of the times. You know, the ones fresh out of the business school or, or, or college or wherever, you know, I'm, you know, old enough to be your parent. So who do you think you are? They were running into that, apparently, in Ephesus and in Crete. So Paul wants him to know to hold firmly uh, to what you're doing. Hold firmly to the faith and a good conscience. You know, don't worry about it. You are doing what you're supposed to be doing. Pay attention uh, to, your, to, your, to your conscience, to your self-judging, but compare it to God's Word. Make sure that any issue we evaluate is looked at in uh, light of God's Word. My worldview, those uh, decisions that I make are going to be evaluated based on the Scriptures. Do I have a thus saith the Lord? Is what it comes down to on whatever decision I'm trying to make. And sometimes you'll get people who claim to to be bound by their conscience to do something because, you know, God told me. You know, be careful, very careful, whenever someone comes to you and says, you know what, God told me to tell you. Or, you know, I've I've watched them on TV where they'll just stop in mid-sentence and say, God just spoke to me and said to tell you. One of these days I'm just going to tell them, you know what, God just told me to tell you no and see what they say. Because God is not talking to us. Uh, well, someone said, you want a, God to speak to you, read his word. You want God to speak to you audibly, read it out loud. That's where God's going to speak to us. Now, you can go to a person, uh, to a Christian, and say, hey, I'm trying to make a decision here, not sure what to do. And we can talk about it. But ultimately, it's going to come down to either one of us getting spoken to out of, God, out of the scriptures, out of God's word. And that's going to be what we need to evaluate issues right and wrong. A good conscience is going to line up with God's Word. Even if God was speaking audibly to that person, and they come and say, well, God spoke to me and told you to do thus and so, if what they're telling you doesn't line up with God's Word, you know it didn't come from God. God's not going to tell you something that contradicts what we have in the Bible. You're not going to be led that way. So when you're, and that's where you have to look at your conscience. My conscience is telling me to do this or do that. What does the Bible say? And make sure whatever you're, you know, you're, whatever you're planning on or thinking or contemplating 
is lines up with Scripture. Because we can look at King Saul. He didn't keep his faith or his conscience clear. He tried to kill David at least twice. He crossed the line and, and uh, went to a, a soothsayer and got that one out, a soothsayer or medium, uh, you know, trying to get Samuel back. And it, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't uh, what he was uh, allowed to do. You're not supposed to cross that line. But he did it anyway. It was very clear. And Saul did not keep his conscience. And what happened? The kingdom, the crown was taken away and given to somebody else. His own sons did not get a chance to inherit it. Second Timothy chapter 1, the purpose of our conscience. It helps us produce a life of godly conduct. This is how we're going to know right or wrong. Notice when reviewing his life, this is uh, Timothy and Titus. Paul's getting to the end of his life. And in reviewing it, he could confidently say he had done everything God told him to do. Mission accomplished. I've done what God told me to do. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. There's a crown laid up for me. I'm just, uh, just coming to the end. I've just got to finish up whatever God wanted him to do. He always served God with a clear conscience. And we mentioned today in the, uh, in the class, the adult class, that Paul uh, or Saul of Tarsus at the time would be Exhibit A of someone whose conscience didn't bother them and was very sincere but was wrong. He was putting Christians in jail. Well, why was he going to Damascus? To bring Christians back to Jerusalem. Now, by that time, it was starting to bother him because Jesus said it's hard for you to kick against the goat. So it was starting to bother him uh, at some point there. Somewhere there, maybe it was the Christians he was arresting and they were praying for him. Maybe he heard them singing, don't know. But by that time, it was starting to get to him. But he, in the beginning, it didn't bother him at all. So our conscience as a value, look at the Corinthian situation, especially in chapters 9 and 10, because we're also going to have to deal with uh, brethren who are not uh, strong, uh, who've got questions. Maybe these were new Christians, weak Christians, however it was working out. Uh, and they had a problem with the meat that was sold in the marketplace. What do we do with that? And that's what Paul is going to address in 1 Corinthians chapters 9 and 10, uh, talking about our personal freedom, personal liberty. What are we going to do? And he quotes Psalm 24 to remind them God created everything, uh, and everything ultimately comes from him. So when we look at this, beginning in verse 21, Of uh, chapter 10, he says, uh, he tells him, first of all, you cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the Lord's table or the table of demons, or do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? All things are lawful for me. Not all things are helpful or profitable, depending on what your translation is. All things are lawful for me, but not all things edify. So he doesn't want them to participate in ceremonies or worship or sacrifices to the pagan gods. But, and some of the Christians didn't see anything wrong with having the meat that was served in them or sold in the marketplace. So what are we supposed to do about that? Because that was the way a lot of religions did. You would offer a, you know, a butcher a cow or an ox or whatever and offer the meat to whatever God, and then some of it would be set aside for the priest, and that's how he fed his family. And then some of it got sold in the marketplace. Okay, so what do I do if I'm looking at this nice piece of steak here and I want to buy it, but it could have been offered to him. Oh, what am I supposed to do with it? Some Christians would be offended by it. Okay, so if you're invited into someone's home and they put some meat in front of you, just eat whatever is offered and don't ask any questions for conscience sake. I guess today we might call it don't ask, don't tell. If you go into someone's house, they're a non-believer and okay, there's a nice juicy steak they've just put down there in front of you and you want to eat, go ahead and eat. And then he goes on, let no one seek his own, but each one the other's well-being. Eat whatever is sold in the meat market, asking no questions for conscience sake, for the earth is the Lord's and all its full fullness. If any of those who do not believe invite you to dinner and you desire to go eat whatever is set before you and asking no questions for conscience sake, now here we might have a problem. 
If anyone who does not believe, or rather, verse 28, if anyone says to you, this was offered to idols, do not eat it, for the sake of the one who told you, for conscience sake, for the earth is the Lord's and, the, and all its fullness. So don't violate the conscience of another believer. So if the host is going into the kitchen and, and someone leans over to you and says, hey, you know what, this was, I know this was offered to, to an idol, to, to a pagan god. Okay, for this person's the sake of this person, and maybe even for your host, don't eat it. If they tell you it was sacrificed for the sake of the one who's informing you, don't eat it. This is where we have to give up our liberties, put things on hold, and think of the person that is with us. It could be a weaker Christian, someone who's got questions, maybe someone who's not a Christian, could be the host. But a lot of the, the commentary I read on this uh, thought it was another believer, another uh, uh, Christian uh, who was probably uh, raising this objection, and, uh, or, or it could have been the host, like I said. But he's making it clear, for conscience sake in that case, don't eat of it, because you don't want to damage somebody else's conscience. See what happens through history what, when people's conscience gets damaged and, and it becomes seared, and they, uh, it gets to where they can't tell right from wrong. Liberty may mean I have to give up something for the weaker brother. And meat in the marketplace that has been offered as part of God's creation, it is not inherently evil of itself. But for the sake of the soul of this weaker brother sitting here at the table with me, I won't eat the meat. Maybe I'll just eat the vegetables, or I might just have to leave, or just you know we'll eat some other time. But for his sake, or her sake, I'm not going to eat the meat that I know was offered to an idol, so that that way it's not going to create a stumbling block for the, the Christian sitting there or the non-believer who might even be testing. Who knows why they, they would have done this. But here's something we have to understand. I may say, okay, I'm not going to eat this meat for right now, but now I need to get with you and let's talk about it and study it and help you in your understanding of what your freedom is, help you to grow in that understanding. This is one of the issues we have. Romans 14 talks a little bit about it with the weaker brother, stronger brother, where many times we let a weaker brother, you know, minority rule the majority, and we don't ever try to study with them and try and encourage them and show them, hey, look, you know, it's okay to eat this meat. It's okay to make this decision from a scriptural viewpoint. It's okay to do this. Let's talk about it. Let's study it. Let's help the weaker brother along so that uh, they, they aren't going to be a weaker brother. They can use it as a growth experience, uh, a teachable moment, maybe, if you will, that we can uh, help them along uh, in those uh, regards. But now what do we do with a damaged conscience? Because the conscience can become seared to where it doesn't bother me to violate scriptural teaching or whatever standard of right and wrong that I have. Not all. This is why the conscience cannot be a 100% surefire guide to doing uh, to judging right and wrong, because not all consciences are good. Ever since the fall, we've become corrupt. Uh, we're all sinners, and we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We got to remember that. We got to remember that not everybody has a biblical worldview. Not only I'm not talking just other religions, but I'm talking uh, athe well, atheism really is a religion. But people who uh, you know, I'm my own man, I make my own uh, luck, I make my own decisions, I make my own morality, then we might have some problems. And so not all consciences are going to be good. The conscience that has been seared, he talks about as with a false, uh, or with a, a, a hot iron, these are people who are past feeling. This is uh, the word here for a hot iron, or seared rather, is the same word we get our word cauterized. When you cauterize uh, something, a heart uh, 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 vein, or, or not a vein, a vessel, I guess, um, and you seal it off with usually with heat, okay, and it scars. That's what he's talking about, okay? They're past feeling. They don't really have a conscience. Things don't bother them anymore. And Paul, for Paul, this is a, the conscience is a very important part of decision-making, uh, especially on, on morals. Not really a moral decision where I'm going to eat lunch today, but it might be a moral decision, uh, certain other activities that I might partake in. Going over to somebody's house and, and uh, I know that they've got the movies or they're doing things that are not becoming of a Christian, I might need to not associate with them. And then just as a good conscience is related to Christian con uh, conduct, the seared conscience is going to be 
uh, uh, relating to perverted or bad conduct. If my conscience is seared and it doesn't bother me to, to lie, it doesn't bother me to run around on my, on my wife or on my family, it doesn't bother me to harm or kill somebody, uh, I've got, I can't use the conscience then as a safe guide to say that God is, is okay with this or this is uh, an okay act because the conscience by that time is pretty well useless. And the possible meanings of a seared conscience right here, they've lost their sensitivity to moral issues. Uh, seared conscience has also got Satan's mark or brand of ownership. These are ones that are really gone. These are ones that are really in bad shape from a moral standpoint. If they're still breathing and still alive, I still think there's a chance we can reach them with the Scripture, reach them with the truth, but it's going to be difficult. And then a seared conscience uh, can have the scar tissue that the Bible calls a hardened heart. That I just don't have a conscience. I just don't care. I just don't care about all those people that are being loaded into the cattle cars and sent off to a death camp. What's that to me? And you can see uh, the film and the pictures of all the atrocities that they commit. And they're not the only ones. About every, uh, every uh, civilization, every nation has got people in it. Every race, every religion has got people in it that can do some pretty bad things and it doesn't bother them. But as Christians, we've got to remember to keep our worldview biblical. We are no longer to behave as those who aren't Christians because of our conversion to Christ. Think of the attitude and the teachings that Jesus left us with. Paul's description of an unconverted man here in Ephesians chapter 4, the Gentiles or the, the ones not converted allowed their sense of moral distinctions to become blurred. We can't let the, ourselves get to that point. And in our society, if you notice, what, the movies that we watch, I can remember as a kid certain movies that would get PG and R ratings that nowadays are getting that PG or PG-13. We're becoming desensitized to a lot of the violence and things we see in films. We are getting desensitized to a lot of other things that go on uh, in our society. Uh, go back, those of you who can remember, to the, uh, 50, 60 years ago. What would have you been your reaction to someone who, uh, you know, a married, uh, or an unmarried couple living together? That, whoa, whoa, scandal. By the 70s, no big deal. Now we're into same-sex relationships, and then look at what they're trying to bring into the schools. And over time, we've gotten desensitized. We've gotten cauterized to it. And so when Paul, looking here in Ephesians, a couple of ideas to lay aside our former manner of life, put all that aside and, and don't imitate the environment around us. We as Christians, when we see the world doing something, we should be going the other way if it's something that violates uh, or is opposed to any principles we see in God's Word. That's our worldview. That is our uh, manual. That is what we stand on. So the world is going to do whatever it's going to do, but as Christians, we've got to resist it. We've got to say, nope, we're not going in that direction. We're going to keep our conscience clear before God, and we're going to uh, make our decisions, our worldview, based on what the Scriptures tell us. So is the conscience a safe guide? I said last week, uh, my wise guy answered, yes, no, and maybe. If your conscience is uh, guided by God's Word, yes, it's a safe guide. If you're using anything else as a guide, then no, it's not. If you're just kind of reading Scripture, learning Scripture, it, it, it could be if you're reading Scripture and you're actually making that application. Someone who's not a Christian who maybe is starting to read and ask questions about it, now they're moving in a direction where the conscience could, could be a safe guide. But only if it's based on God's Word can it be a safe guide, a, def, a, a definite safe guide. Popular fiction is just follow your conscience. My conscience may be leading me to do some things that aren't right. It may be leading me to do some things that got not God's word and any sense of, of decency says is wrong. But hey, if it doesn't bother my conscience, it's okay to follow it, right? No, we come back to what God's word says. We base our worldview and our decisions on God's word. What are you standing on today? Is the Bible guiding your conscience so it will be a safe guide? Is the Bible what you're letting dictate your worldview? This morning, if we can we help you, we offer the invitation. We offer the invitation to help Christians who are struggling or anyone who needs to be immersed into Christ to have their sins forgiven so they can have that safe guide. And if we can help you, let us know as together we stand and as we sing.